the guys from Mark Howard with Momentum on Strategies, and I want to encourage you to stay tuned to the Empower Series YouTube channel so that you can learn nuggets. This month's topic was on financial literacy. Uh, some of the things that you'll be able to learn today would be on how to set a budget, what the concept of cash flow, net worth is, the importance of insurance in your life, and why you need to protect yourself and those loved ones around you, uh, the criticalness of having an emergency fund because life is risky and you need to be prepared for those uh, moments in life that, that you don't anticipate. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about debt, credit, and taxes and how that affects you and your life and how you need to prepare for those as well. And then we'll touch a little bit on investing and the different types of vehicles available to you from short term, medium to long term, uh, and how you need to diversify those assets to fill your portfolio to hit your specific needs. So I want to encourage you again to spend a little bit of time, invest in yourself, stay tuned to the Empower series. I want to thank Comerica Bank for being a proud sponsor. Uh, and encourage you to reach out to me at any time if you have questions. Again, it's Mark at Momentum Wealth Strategies. So, um, the one guy who I think was from Germany, I think summed it up quite well. He says, people here, meaning in the United States, spend more than they have. And it really is a uh, culture of spend first, save second. And so we'll talk a little bit about that and how it's so important for you to change that habit within your own household so that you can create that budget to achieve the goals that you, you have in place. So to achieve your goals, here's some basic guidelines that we're going to walk through. One is you have to set some goals. How many of you have a yearly or monthly savings goal? Raise your hands. And so for those who didn't raise your hands, what is stopping you from creating that goal? Because really, if you're trying to save for a house, save for college, save to buy that car, whatever it is, you need to have those goals in place that you're shooting for and then a plan that you're executing to achieve that. Uh, Second one is exactly what we just talked about. You need to spend less than you earn. That sounds like a simple concept, right? But uh, spend less than you earn. Create an emergency fund. An emergency fund doesn't mean here's the pile of money you have on the side for retirement and it's, it's serving as an emergency fund, and it's serving as uh, your, your, uh, vacation. your vacation fund. <laughs> this is specifically for emergencies. And make it a priority. Look at your credit cards. How many of you guys have a credit card that you had a teaser rate, and it's now slipped into a 18 to 21 to 25% interest rate? and you're, you're getting charged interest for stuff like that, you know? Happens all the time. And so you gotta look at these things di diligently, uh, evaluate your insurance, and think about taxes. And so let's jump in. So think of your finances as a house, like I mentioned earlier. What's the most important portion of your house, but maybe it's the least sexy? The foundation, right? And so have you ever looked for a house and it says, yeah, the foundation was just repaired and it comes with a lifetime warranty. Do you feel more drawn to that house or are you thinking, yeah, I think I want to, I might want to keep looking? Uh, it's true. And so the foundation is what I call your cash flow and net worth. And so cash flow and net worth is basically cash flow is the money you have coming in versus the money you have going out. So it's the amount of income you're earning subtracted uh, from that is the expenses you have. And so one of the sheets that you have in the workbook is a basic cash flow statement. 
so that you can look at, hopefully when you get home, what are some of the major sources of expenses that maybe you underestimated. You know, is it the $5 trip to Starbucks every day that you thought, ah, oh, it's just five bucks. But five bucks times five times four weeks, you're at $100 right there. And then it's the going out to the club and, and just, I'll just buy two $15 drinks and, and then that starts to add up. And so it is essential, I mean essential, you'll see in both my workbook and in the one from the Federal Reserve, having a cash flow statement so that you can see what's going in and how much is going out. Six and seven on the, uh, the color book, the building wealth. And so a lot of times people say, well, what's, what are items that maybe I should look at reducing, eliminating? And so you have your fixed expenses. Maybe that's your mortgage. Uh, it's, a, it's amounts that don't really change on a monthly basis. You put those down. Then you have flexible amounts. These might be your cell phone bill, your utility bills. These are still essential items to your day-to-day -day life, but maybe they vary, so you have those in a separate budget. And then you have those that are discretionary. So the Starbucks, the entertainment, the going out to eat. And so put that in a, in a separate uh, line item. And then you have your taxes that you have to set aside for every year. And so if you take that from all the sources of income, that's basically what people say when they say cash flow. And so again, Today is really intended to, if there are concepts that you've heard and you're like, I really don't know what that means, let's talk about it. So does everyone understand the concept of cash flow? So the next is, well, we talked about budget. So the next is net worth. So is, is the concept of net worth is basically everything you owe, subtract from that, everything that you own. So you might own a house, a car, your 401k, savings account, things that you own minus things that you owe. So credit card debt, student loans, the mortgage on your house. You subtract that from what you own and that's your net worth. So can you have a negative net worth? Yes or no? Who says yes? And is that a good thing? Why not? You're upside down. Uh, what else? You're not building wealth. Vulnerable. So you think you have more stress or less stress if you're upside down? More. Way more. We hear way more over here. So, so. Net worth is a simple concept, but it's one that uh, in America, for African Americans especially, the net worth average household. So Alexis, what's the latest number on the, the net worth? Isn't it like about 11,000? The net worth of the average household in America, African American household is $11,000. For single African-American women, it's about $1,000. So think about that. What we own minus what we owe is barely more than the cost of a used car. And so one of the things that advisors at our firm and across a, a multitude of, of companies are really striving to do is educate people on how do we fix this because this adds a lot of stress. It, it doesn't leave a legacy to your kids and your kids' kids. And, and it really puts you in a situation where you are spending more than you earn. So Clifton. So Mark, here's what I want you to speak to. Because a lot of times, as a financial advisor, people come to you wanting to know about Bitcoin or investment strategies or how do you read the stock market. But at the end of the day, there are basic success habits of the clients you have that are wealthy. 
And it's not the most sexy, exciting thing, but it's, I believe it's, it's the first thing we can talk about. So I want you to talk about the importance of having these successful behaviors of budgeting and knowing your cash flow, your net worth, and how important that is as a foundational step. At least that's, that's Yeah, no, and that, that's a great point because one of the first things I know we have some Comerica guys in there. One of the first things you do when you go to a bank and you're looking for a loan is they're wanting to see your personal financial statement. They're wanting to see, well, what is your net worth to assess who you are and what are your financial habits to determine, do I trust that if I give you this $100,000 loan, you're going to pay me back? And so those clients, and, I, and it's, it's so true, Clifton, I have clients who come to me in their 30s, and they already have it figured out. They have a budget, they own a house, they might even have a business on the side, they have a retirement plan that's in place, they know exactly where their money's going, and so they've set uh, financial behaviors in their house, even their kids. Their kids typically have a budget where they'll give them an allowance, and they know, okay, I can either spend this on these toys or I can save it maybe for a bigger toy later or invest it for the future. And so they're training their kids to have these habits that maybe they didn't have or maybe they did have growing up. And so it's really all about save first, spend second. And then when you're spending, it's all along a budget that you are tracking monthly quarterly and yearly. You know, at our Lunch and Learn yesterday, uh, Clifton actually brought up a great point of if you were in charge of your department's budget. So now you've been charged with, you have a million dollar budget to manage uh, the expenses for that, for that project that you're working on for the rest of the year. Would you spend it kind of casually or would you look at it every single week to make sure you're on track? Would you look at it every month? Would you maybe go to your supervisor and ask, hey, how are we doing on, on the budget? That's the exact same thing that those clients who really are on top of things are doing in their sleep. They do it as a matter of habit, and they enjoy doing it because they see how they're tracking towards their goals on a yearly, decade, and lifetime basis. So if there's anything, I say the difference between those successful clients and those that are just trying to figure it out is they've taken the time to come to classes like this. They've taken the time to speak with a professional and they've set down on paper their goals, their vision, and where it is they're trying to go. Doesn't matter how far behind the curve you think you might be, you gotta start somewhere. And don't be afraid because the farther you put it off, the more intimidating it's gonna get. And don't be shy on calling an advisor like myself, Alexis, Clifton, anyone, that's what they're there for to do is to help. You wanna avoid those guys that are trying to nickel and dime you with the fees and all that, and so you gotta find the right one, but that's what they're here for. Um, and they wanna have those success stories that they can talk about in workshops like this. So, uh, good segue though. So, credit cards, Credit is one of the financial aspects that people mis, uh, misunderstand a ton. Your credit begins the second you have a credit card and you either pay it on time, you pay it late, or you don't pay it at all. That's recorded in your history so that when someone comes to look at you and say, hey, do I want to give you this loan for this car? That's why your rate might be 18% versus your neighbor's 5%. It's because they're looking at that history and they're evaluating what is the likelihood that you are going to pay on time. And so the question I often get is how many credit cards should you have? And we heard on, we heard on the video, it ranged between zero to five. I like to say you have maybe two. You have one credit card that you're paying every month and you're paying it off. It's what goes in, goes out. 
and then maybe you have one for major purchases where you aren't able to pay for that entire item, but you are managing and planning to pay it off over a certain period of time. Does that make sense? Anyone disagree? Who thinks you should have three, four? No? And I'll tell you, I got caught up uh, in one of those teaser rates. I bought a TV that you might argue I didn't need from Best Buy on one of those 0% credit cards. Something was going funky with the, with the TV within the first couple of weeks, so I returned it, purchased another one, but it was like $100 difference. And so I had calculated off that first TV the exact amount that I needed to pay every month to pay it off so I wouldn't be hit with that credit card charge. But I didn't go back and do it after I got the new TV. And so at the end of six months, I get this huge interest bill because I just hadn't watched it because I just assumed it was on autopilot and I will never do that again. <laughs> I will never do that again. But watch your credit because there's so much around uh, people stealing your identity, uh, you taking advantage of the credit card you have. This is one of the fundamentals that we see the most uh, that affects negatively a person's financial situation. So next level up, once you've created that, that sound foundation, is risk management. And why we have this so uh, important as a second level is life is risky, right? I mean, who can predict what's gonna happen to you in your life over the next eight months of this year, you know? Are you gonna have a car accident? Are you going to have some unexpected expense? Is there gonna be an opportunity maybe that you, you could invest in something? And so risk management is so key because you're protecting your most valuable assets. And quite often that starts with uh, what we talked about emergency fund is life insurance. So why should we have life insurance? Give me some examples of why should we have an insurance policy on yourself? Right, you guys hear that? So it's not a matter of if we're gonna die, it's when. It's a fact. And so maybe you wanna use that life event to help cover and help your loved ones who might be left behind. So life insurance really is a gift of love to those people you care most about. Uh, so what are some other reasons why you might wanna have life insurance? Right. Or not even just funerals, but expenses in general, because whether we pass or not, those things are still going to be there. So it'll be helpful to kind of lessen the burden on those people that'll still be here. Right. So who wants to be a burden to your spouse, to your kids, to your employees if you own a business? And a life insurance policy can be used to eliminate that so that they don't have to worry. A lot of times we hear, if it's a husband wife is, oh shoot, I don't wanna leave a policy because then she'll just go off and run some, marry some guy and just you know, spend all my money. <laughs> and then, you know, not to be disrespectful, I have to take a step back and say, well, you do realize that your spouse is 50 with four of your kids. You know, how attractive do you think that is at, at the club at night, you know? <laughs> And so it's like, you know, you're over assuming all of this, but you have plans in place. You know, you have this vision of a retirement. You have this vision of college for your kids. You have this vision for the business that you guys are going to open. Wouldn't you want your, your spouse to continue on with that, even if you aren't here? And so it really is uh, an act of love. Uh, and so there's a couple of types of policies one is group insurance, which you typically will get at work. And then you have an individual policy. 
So how many of you have group insurance but no personal policy? Group but no personal, all right. So how many people feel that what you have at work is enough? Because we get that all the time. Oh, I'm covered at work. So covered at work typically means you have one to three times your salary. So let's just say you make 50,000 and you have two times your salary. So that's 100,000 of coverage. You'll basically run through that in a year to a year and a half once you add up all the expenses of paying off your debt, funeral expenses, any other things you have. So your spouse would have maybe a year's worth of safety net and then they're having to figure out life all alone without your salary. And so that's why we typically suggest let's start at 10 times your salary for an amount that you want to have as coverage. And so that's where you get to those numbers. A lot of people say, how, how do I need a, a million dollar policy? Well, if you make 50,000 and you're 40 years old and you plan on living till, till, if you plan on working till 60, if you just multiply it out, the number of years you have left to work, so 20 years times $50,000 is what? That's a million dollars. So if you had a tree in the back of your house that was spitting out $50,000 a year, would you buy a policy to protect it? If it stopped spitting out some money, would you go check on it? Right, so same thing here. You are your most valuable asset. How many of you guys have Apple Care on your iPhone? Come on, raise your hand. I know you guys do. Or coverage on your cell phone. Again, you got coverage on your cell phone that's worth way more than, than, than the phone is worth and not on your phone. So look at a personal policy for yourself, especially if all you have is group. Because when you leave that job, that policy typically stays with the company. So you're having to start over at an older age and maybe at an unhealthier state. Question. So I know you were saying like um, about group and they also get an additional policy. But do you recommend that for, I guess, younger people with no dependents whatsoever? Because I know your example, you were saying like you pass away at 40, you have 20 more years to work and then like your spouse is still there and therefore your income is gone. But like, in my situation, like no dependents whatsoever, do you still recommend getting married? So do you plan on getting married? Eventually. Do you plan on having kids? Eventually. Do you plan on retiring? Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> the basic concept of life insurance is the rating is on your age and your health. So if you get it younger, you'll pay a lot less than you would if you waited for 10 years, let's say, and you did have that family. And so then there's other types of insurance. So maybe because of your age, you'd want to look at a permanent policy that you could keep your whole life or a policy that builds cash. And so now you're starting younger. And so the amount of money that you have to put into that policy to, a, to achieve a certain goal is a lot less than your 10-year older self would have to do to achieve those same things. So absolutely, it makes sense. Uh, you'd, you'd want to understand what are the different types to see what might be a better sit, uh, fit for your situation. But absolutely, even if you're single, there's a need for a, a good policy. No, 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 good question. So health insurance. Medical costs are the number one cause of bankruptcy for individuals and their families, especially as you get into retirement. So this is critical, and with uh, the Affordable Care Act, it's really become more of a forefront uh, in everyone's minds because now it's required that you have to have a policy. And so with the Affordable Care Act, you know, there's certain things that change where pre-existing conditions don't have to negatively affect your ability to get a policy. Uh, some costs are minimized. And so you really do want to sit down again with your insurance provider to understand how your policy might have changed from year in and year out. Because 
these costs keep escalating and you're probably finding at work that you have uh, health savings accounts, flexible savings accounts. There's lots of different tools that are available to you to manage your health costs. And so if you have access to a health savings account and you have regular medical bills, it would make sense for you to start pre-funding that so you can have some tax advantages. Flexible spending accounts, same thing. It gives you an ability to have to take advantage of some of the tax savings for those regular bills that you know you're going to have. Who knows what COBRA is? And have you ever had to be on it? It's a snake. It's a snake. <laughs> COBRA, again, if you find yourself unemployed, this is the legally uh, uh, available to you option to carry on the, the health policy that your, your company might have offered to you. But maybe it's not the best option because it's at full cost and it's typically a lot more expensive than you ever expected because your company quite often is subsidizing your health insurance. And so there are individual policies out there that might make more sense. And with uh, Obamacare, there are uh, lots of carriers out there that offer policies that might make more, might make more sense. So understand you know, your options out there. Uh, Medicaid, Medicare, some other government fundings, you have to qualify for those. But health insurance is huge, so don't uh, ignore it. So disability insurance is probably the most underutilized type of, of policy out there, but it affects us more than, uh, than life insurance, actually. So disability insurance is not just for those people you see in a wheelchair, not for those people that you, know, might, you might categorize as handicapped. It's for anybody that can't go to work prescribed by a doctor and you have to stay at home. And so just imagine if tomorrow something happened to you, whatever it is, and so you couldn't work for 30 days. Your employer, if you don't have short-term disability, could stop paying you because you're not earning your salary. And so think of disability insurance as really your income continuation, should something happen to you. It's income replacement. And so if you're sick, health insurance is trying to make you better. If you're disabled, disability insurance is just keeping your income coming to you so that you can take care of yourself. So quite often at work you have maybe a short-term disability and a long-term. Maybe you have to pay into that extra. I would totally look at what those costs are. Uh, and if you're not contributing, look at contributing because quite often there are dollars per month for you to have the ability to get your paycheck should something happen to you. And I'm sure you guys all know somebody who might have been in an accident or they had a health scare or something. Even if you have a baby, that's short-term disability. So uh, re-look at your benefits uh, when open enrollment comes just to see and understand when they say one times and two times salary for insurance and when it has certain percentages. And so the way disability insurance is typically priced is a percent of your salary. So there might be a 30% of salary, there might be 50%. Look at that just to see if you can add to what you might already have. So long-term care. Which of these two pictures do you think best reflects a long-term care scenario? The one on the left or right? The right? Wait, who says right? Who says left? Who says both? It was a trick question. Come on, guys. You knew that. It's both. Oftentimes, same thing. I don't need long-term care. I'm Superman. I never get sick. I'm going to live till 100. And then, bam, you know, something happens. So long-term care can affect anybody at any age. Uh, don't only associate long-term care with nursing homes. All long-term care means is you need help 
after 90 days of being in the hospital and they couldn't, they couldn't fix you. And so at some point, your insurance says, hey, this recovery isn't working. We need to sustain you. And that's where long-term care comes in. And so again, that could be an accident from a, a car accident where you, you have a debilitation on, of your leg, your arms, whatever. Long-term care helps to provide the services to take care of you typically after day 91. So again, the younger you are, the healthier you are, the more affordable long-term care will be. If you put it off until, quote unquote, you're in the left side of the, uh, the picture, then it might be too expensive and you don't get it at all. So you're better off looking at it sooner rather than later. Make sense? Yeah. Questions? Well, before you leave health insurance, uh topic uh do you have uh, i mean it, for 2018 uh do you think we'll be required to have um insurance all 12 months like we have had to have up to now due to you know trump isn't he going to change the affordable care uh so the the question is do we think that they're going to require health insurance uh, for the rest of 2018 and the answer is absolutely yes any changes that are put in place will affect 2019 okay. at the earliest. Uh, 2018 is already set, and so those changes, just like the tax laws are for, 20, uh, for 2018, where you'll pay them in 2019, same thing, the, the health care laws are in place for this year. Any changes would be for next year. Okay, thank you. Good question, though. So the next level up is planning for the future. And so for those of you who have kids and you're looking at college funding uh, or those who are looking forward to retirement planning, it's really after you've figured out your cash flow and net worth, you then protected all those valuable assets uh, in your life that you then really should start looking at planning for the future. Quite often people will skip the first two steps just start throwing money at college savings or throwing money at retirement and they don't have a strong foundation that they've built upon and uh, they haven't protected those items should something risky happen in life. So college funding, there's co college rates are increasing at an alarming uh, pace. I know when I went to undergrad, I went to Howard undergrad, I think tuition then was 16,000 a year back in the olden days. Uh, I'm actually going to visit my son this afternoon who's at Stanford. Just guess how much his bill is on a yearly basis. 45, 67, it's about $70,000. So multiply that times four, and what do you have? $300,000. And does Stanford give academic scholarships? No. <laughs> so state schools, University of Texas, I mean, you're still in the 35, 40K range for UT. Um, so there's lots of strategies that you can put in place. You could go to a community college for two years, get your basics out of the way, and then transfer to one of these schools. You can apply. There's lots of private scholarships out there. There's federal aid based on your parents' uh, income level. And so take advantage of the resources. There's a couple of websites at the back of my uh, worksheet. Um, because there are some ways to reduce your, your tuition bill, and there's some credits that are available to you. Some of you guys might have just done your taxes and have kids in college, and there are some small tax credits that you have. So uh, take advantage, again, by sitting down with a professional and understanding what are some of those strategies, because college is uh, becoming more and more expensive. It's, it's increasing much faster than inflation and it's typically increasing much faster than our incomes are growing. So 
to me, it, it's an issue that we have to face. Whether you, you liked Bernie's free college for everyone or not, I think we do have a, uh, a problem that we have to address because our kids are now being burdened with $200,000 of debt and they're having to figure out how do you pay that off before you can start building that wealth because are they in a negative net worth situation from day one? So it's, it's a scary uh, thought. So then you got retirement planning. And so that's typically broken down into two sections. You have qualified plans and you have personal plans. So who understands what the term qualified means? Qualified? Nope. So if you hear the term qualified, all that means is you're funding that plan with pre-tax dollars. That's all it means. So your 401k is a qualified plan because you're funding it with pre-tax dollars. An IRA, a traditional IRA, qualified because you're funding it with pre-tax dollars. So what does funding it with pre-tax dollars mean? Do you have to pay taxes on that eventually? Yes? yes? Anybody say no? So we got all yeses. Um, so the answer is yes. So you have $100 going into a qualified pre-tax plan, so $100 into your IRA. It grows to $1,000. Once you pull that money out, how much of it does, does, is going to be taxed? All of it. All of it, because you haven't paid taxes on any of it. So if you were to put money into a Roth IRA, a Roth IRA you're funding with after-tax dollars. And so if you make $100, you pay your taxes, let's say you're in 25% tax bracket, you have 75 going in, and then it grows, how much of it are you taxed on when you pull it out at the end? None. None. So you either pay taxes now or later, those are qualified accounts. And so you want to sit down with someone to strategize on, should I be doing a Roth? Should I be investing in my company's Roth 401k? Should I be looking at some after-tax investments um, to balance those out? Because there are strategies that you can minimize taxes by planning today. So if taxes go up, which most people think they're going to do, would you be better off funding a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA? Roth? Why so? Why so? You're going to pay more out at the end? Yeah, so if taxes increase, would you rather pay your low taxes now or higher taxes later? So now, so Roth. Right, and so you got to look at those. Don't just kind of blindly go into, let me check the box, and here it is. Understand those small differences because it can have a big impact later on uh, in life. So question, what is a Roth 401k? So a traditional 401k, you're funding it with pre-tax dollars. So because of the popularity of Roth IRAs, they created a Roth 401k so that people who were only funding their retirement at work through a, through a 401k would have the option to now fund it with after-tax dollars so they were taxed today and they won't have to be taxed in the future. And so it's a very popular option and you're seeing it offered at more and more companies because we're in a relatively low tax rate environment right now. And so we talked about this yesterday, you know, should you invest in the Roth 401k or traditional 401k? Quite often the answer is do both. Um, if historically you've only funded a pre-tax traditional, maybe you want to shift and do much more in the Roth. Uh, because most people want to hedge their bets and have a little bit of both. Because you don't really know where taxes are going. So... Um, maybe hedge your bets. If you do have a crystal ball, you're going to want to pick one or the other. But good question. So any of these stats surprise you guys? So 
So 50% are saving for retirement through a 401k. So if your company matches your contributions, is there a better investment for you out there? Name a better investment than taking advantage of the match from your company's 401k. Free money. So what is free money? That's a 100% rate of return. Who, who's getting 100% in the stock market right now? Now, Lena said she was getting 15% yesterday. Who's, who's getting better than 15%? 20%? We got any 25s? So 100% rate of return. Think about that, guys. 100% rate of return. So again, it goes back to save first, spend second. So if you've allocated your 10% saving for the future, saving for emergency savings, and you can take advantage of that 100% rate of return, you are so much better off than if you didn't. So number one rule when I see clients who have an employer who matches is are you contributing up to their match? And if they're not, it's why are you not? And we're as quickly as possible getting them to a situation where they can. There's really no other better place than to start than there. So one in three have zero saved for retirement. And quite often we're getting people older and older coming to us saying, hey, I'm 62 and I want to retire at 65 and I have 100,000 saved up. Is that enough? Well, how much are you living on? each year, you know, $5,000. And so you have to do some simple math of how much do I need to have in order to retire at a certain age? So who in here knows their number for the amount you need to save today on an ongoing basis to hit your retirement goals in the future? Who's, who sat down and done that calculation? So everybody's done that calculation? Nobody's done it? Save as much as possible. That's all we can do. No, you can create that plan to look at, here's the amount that I need to be saving. Whether or not you can do it, here's what I need to be doing to hit those goals. And so, again, as a part of your financial plan, we want you to create that budget, look at your cash flow, Look at your net worth, and then also look at your long-term goals and plans. Whether it's saving for college, whether it's saving for retirement, and set out a plan because maybe you have the ability. So just, just a sidebar note, I was just in Washington, D.C. because I'm one of the political involvement leaders at New York Life. And so we were lobbying Congress and Senate on a simple concept. So... Congressmen have what's called a thrift savings plan. That's their retirement plan. And at the top it shows, here's my, here's my, but, here's my uh, balance. So let's say they have a million dollars. And then at the top right, it has a number that represents, here's the amount you could have monthly as a guaranteed stream of income for the rest of your life based on this balance. So how wouldn't that be nice for you to have on your 401k or on your IRA that would say, okay, this $100,000 I have equals X amount of dollars per month for the rest of my life so that you could say, well, shoot, I need more than $200 a month, so maybe I need to be saving more. Or 1000 bucks a month, that's about right, so let me continue doing what I'm doing. And so that's a part of this plan of how much is what I'm saving going to amount to in monthly and yearly income for the rest of my life. And so that's some of the things that we do. We help our clients. So don't um, using your 401k uh, with your employer, don't use that as your starting point. 
know, they, they tell you whether or not they don't think that's enough. Or what yeah. have you. So isn't that part of something that your 401k provider does? Some do, some don't. Yeah. Oh, okay. And that was our whole point, was we want to make it required okay. so that all providers have that there mm -hmm. to be a visual guide to the everyday person who's not looking at this day in and day out. Just to give you a guide into something that makes sense to you because you might say, hey, I have $100,000, I'm six figures, I have a lot. And you've never translated that into how much does this mean for me in retirement on a monthly basis to my projected life income. So sit down and talk because the, you know there are people who wait until it's really too late and now they're having to get on Medicaid. They're having to live with their kids. They're having to, you know, be homeless. There's, it, it, it happens to more people than you might think. What are your thoughts on um, Social Security's viability past, what, 2027 or whatever the year is? Yep, so what do we think about Social Security? So who thinks Social Security will be here in its current form in 10 years? Okay, Edson has some faith. <laughs> um, I think Social Security is going to be here. Mm -hmm. Just in what format, I don't know. Uh, I think they're going to push the retirement age out a couple of years for sure. Uh, whether it's early at 62, that might be pushed to 65. You know, 65 might get pushed out to 67, 68. I definitely think we're going to push out the retirement age. Um, not sure about the, the percent, because really, if you look at the amount that Social Security pays you, if you're able to push it out today to full retirement at 70, it's increasing the amount that you have guaranteed better than you can achieve typically in the market. So it's a great thing if you can wait, just most people aren't in a situation to where they can wait. So I think it'll be here, but we often show a stool that has three legs. The first leg being what pension money do you have available to you? 401k money. The second is social security. And the third is typically personal savings. And so a lot of clients say, I don't have a pension, and I'm not contributing as much as I need to, to my 401k. I don't have faith in my Social Security future. So it puts a lot more focus on your personal. So you need to look at what you're doing to supplement. And what you get at work quite often is not enough. So again, I've said this quite a bit because I want to drill this into your head. Spend first save last or save first, spend last. So you want to be on the right side here, not the left side, right? And it's all about behavior. It's having that budget so that you're paying uh, your, your requirements first and then you're playing later. So you want to be the save first, spend last for sure. And do that based on your budget. Do it on a budget so that you have a game plan as to where you're going. How much have you currently saved? Look at the reality, guys. If it's zero, put zero down. There's a, a page in the workbook for that. And then put a goal. And then just do some quick math of dividing it by 12, and here's what you need to do. And start looking in your cash flow for where you can find it. You'd be surprised. Oh, I, I didn't see this recurring bill that's, that I'm not even using this service anymore. You know, I never watch Netflix. You know, I can get rid of that or whatever it is. So mint.com is a great starting point as an online uh, budget service if you haven't used it. It's free. Mint.com. M-I-N-T.com. It's a great tool for you to use where you can enter in your budget, tie it to your bank account, tie it to your credit cards so that you can go out there and monitor your habits 
And then you can adjust things uh, as you go on. And again, it's free. And if you can get into the habit of looking at that every month, it'll show you trends. Oh, by the way, Edson, you know, your entertainment spending has gone up over the last year considerably. Divorce, you, know? you know, divorce, you know. Got to get out. <laughs> Got to get out. <laughs> things have changed, you know. Or uh, it'll show meals have gone up because maybe you're going out a lot. Do you want to continue that? Mint.com is a great tool to get you guys started. If you like electronic, if you're better on pen and paper, do pen and paper. Uh, do something. So 11 strategies and we'll wrap up. Start small. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Start small. Relish in those, uh, those, those small wins. And then it will build momentum into larger and larger successes. Understand compounding interest. Compounding interest is tied to the amount of time you have left uh, with your financial plan. And it, as Benjamin Franklin said, it's, it's one of the most wonderful things that exists in the world, more so than the light bulb. Um, contribute to your retirement plan. If your employer matches, take advantage of it. If there's payroll deduction options, do it. Set stuff up automatically. You know, maybe there's an IRA that you contribute to where it automatically is deducting from your account so you don't have to think about it. Round up payments. So if you're spending $675 on something, take that quarter and save it. There's a great tool out there now called Acorns that does exactly that. It looks at your, your spending and it will automatically round up all of your expenses and take those cents, put it into an account, and it's a small savings account you have on the side. Spend less than you earn. So if you're not already doing that, take whatever pay raise you get and put that aside to contribute to your retirement plans, your savings plans, your emergency savings funds, whatever it is. Get into the culture of spending less than you earn. If you spend more than you earn, your net worth will always be negative. Paying off those loans, pay off those credit cards. Reinvest, again, that's a part of compounding interest. With your investments, you have the options typically of, do I take the, the gains and spend it, or do I take it and reinvest it? Quite often, if you're in a long-term strategy, you want to reinvest. And then keep track of where everything goes, to the penny. Who tracks their money right now to the penny? We had a couple of people, Clifton in the back, we got a couple, Michelle. You'd be amazed as to where your money goes. I challenge you to do it for three months. Track it to the penny. And hey, hey, we said start small. Start, start small. <laughs> there you go. Keep going. And so understand your investment options. You know, again, that's what we're here for. Um, find an advisor you're comfortable with and let them know the ins and outs of your situation so that they can figure out what's best for you. Because there's lots of different options out there. We don't have time to go into these specifics, but that's what we're here there for, is to help you figure out what's the right investment for your specific situation. And not all investments are created equal, and, and it, you don't want to have an advisor who's got a hammer and he's trying to knock whatever he's selling into to your plan. You really want to have someone who's looking at the whole picture. And start young, teach your kids. And so in the back, I actually have another book. I wasn't sure who wanted it. So on your way out, I have another pamphlet on teaching your kids about money. And so it breaks down some of these concepts into behaviors that they might understand. Uh, and so here's just some things on you know, creating a savings account, giving them an allowance. You know, for middle school, it's maybe investing in a stock so they can see how it grows. With a teenager, it's 
having them contribute to you know the car that they're uh, they're driving or uh, contributing to their their going out expenses and so in the back there's a, a, a booklet that anyone can take I have quite a few uh, to start early start young and uh, keep the whole house intact and so just to review and sum up cash flow net worth so what's cash flow again it's the amount you have coming in versus going out net worth is how much you own minus what you owe and are we trying to get to positive net worth or negative? Positive. positive. Uh, risk management. Should we have a life insurance policy if we are eligible bachelorette with no kids? <laughs> All right. And um, retirement planning is having zero dollars saved for retirement at the age of 65 a good thing or a bad thing? Bad, very bad. <laughs> and so wealth accumulation is where it all ends up. So uh, again, there's some tools I have at the back of the book. Uh, I encourage you guys to start today. If you have questions, feel free to email me on uh, my email address and phone numbers are on the newsletter. They're at the back of the front and back of the workbook. Uh, I'd ask you guys, if you haven't filled out the workshop evaluation, please do so. I'd love to hear good and bad, what, what you, you thought of the, the content and the delivery.